Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. We have been having series of webinars in the past organized by the Sri Lankan Veterinary Association. Today is one another important lecture on biliary surgical emergencies, rather a new topic to us. This lecture is for about 45 minutes, followed by questions and answers. You can type the questions on the chat box during the lecture or after the lecture, or you can ask direct questions after the lecture. Before start, I would like to request to mute the microphone during the lecture. First, I would like to invite Dr. Randika Gunaradhana, President SLVA, to address the virtual gathering. Thank you very much, Dr. Dayani. Uh, actually, I'm very happy here today, the pleasant Sunday, actually. Everybody's uh, keep on resting today. And today we have a new guest uh, skipper, um, uh, speaker today, actually, Dr. Mahika. And we are very proud of you, Mahika. Actually, you uh, being Sri Lankan origin, you went to UK and you had a lot of experience. You are doing your residencies and we are going to have some specialists, one of the specialists in the particular field of uh, this biliary uh, duct and biliary you know, operations and those kind of stuff. So, and uh, and I'm again happy to uh, announce that we are uh, conducting this webinar for the 20th time. And uh, so I, even though there's a COVID uh, situation in the country, we, we didn't uh, stop our working and we, are, we just uh, started working on Zoom platforms. So, so likewise, we were able to complete nearly 20 uh, webinars. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, participants. And, uh, we got a lot of um, recognition for that even. Even the World Veterinary Association also recognized our activities uh, in this webinar. And uh, so once again, welcoming you all, my teachers and my dear colleagues and all veterinarians and the veterinarians who are joining here with us today from all over the world. And uh, you all are mostly welcome for today's webinar. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll hand over the forum to Khadayan again. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now I invite Dr. Sugat Premachandra, Secretary SLVA to address, introduce the speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dayani. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our resource person today, Dr. Mahika Seniratna. Dr. Mahika Seniratna graduated from the University of Cambridge in 2014. She then spent a year in practice in Sri Lanka before returning to the UK to complete a rotating internship in small animal medicine and surgery at the Royal University College London. <laughs> Mahika then went on to complete a European College of Veterinary Surgery approved residency at the Royal Veterinary College London from 2018 to 2021. She is a well famous veterinarian in Sri Lanka. On behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to invite Dr. Mahika Seniratna to continue the program. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's lecture. Um, let me try and start sharing my screen so we can get started. Um, hopefully, you can all see my presentation now. Yes, Dr. Mahika. You can, yeah, you can see. Yes, Dr. Mahika, we can see you. Perfect. Okay, so um, today we're just going to be discussing biliary surgery. Um, I'll start off with some basic anatomy and physiology, and then we can go through some case examples that will hopefully highlight some common surgical procedures and, and um, the indications for biliary surgery. Um, so so uh, starting off, this is just a slide that demonstrates the anatomy of the biliary system. The gallbladder, it sits between a fossa in bet uh, between the right medial lobes. Um, bile is then produced in the liver and it drains via multiple hepatic ducts into the common bile duct. Um, bile is stored in the gallbladder and bile from the gallbladder enters the common bile duct by the cystic duct. So that is just highlighted in the diagram on to the left of your screen. Uh, the common bile duct goes on to enter the duodenum about three centimeters of boral to the pylorus, where it travels a few centimeters within the wall of the duodenum and um, terminates at the major duodenal papilla. 
The picture on the right is a cross section of the inside of the duodenal wall, which just shows the opening of the common bile duct um, via the major duodenal papilla into the duodenum. And um, so here it's quite important to discuss some um, anatomic species differences because these differences then have consequences on the pathophysiology of the diseases that we see. Um, so in dogs, the common bile duct enters the duodenum at the major duodenal papilla. Um, this is adjacent to the pancreatic duct. So they have two separate openings, but they are adjacent to each other. The accessory pancreatic duct enters the minor duodenal papilla, which is a few centimeters away from the major duodenal papilla. And in dogs, this is actually the main route for pancreatic secretions. Um, by contrast, in cats, the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct share a common opening at the major duodenal papilla. And again, unlike dogs, only about 20% of cats have an accessory duct. So the major route for pancreatic secretions in the cat is the major pancreatic duct. Um, so because of this common opening of the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct, diseases or um, anything that affects the major duodenal papilla will affect both the pancreas and the biliary system in cats. Um, so coming on to uh, the pathophysiology of extrahepatic biliary obstruction. So firstly, what is extrahepatic biliary obstruction? This is when we see obstruction of the common bile duct that results in a lack of bile entering the duodenum. So the common features that we see on imaging with this disease is that we can see dilation of the common bile duct, dilation of the intrahepatic ducts, dilation of the cystic duct and the gallbladder. Um, common causes of this in dogs are pancreatitis, neoplasia, gallbladder mucosils, cholangitis, and cholelithiasis. Um, I'll be covering some of these conditions in the talk as we go along. In cats, by far the most common reason for extrahepatic biliary obstruction is what we call this inflammatory complex or triaditis. Um, it's a combination of pancreatitis, cholangiohepatitis, and inflammatory enteropathies. Um, cats can also get biliary neoplasia, parasitic infections. We've also seen diaphragmatic um, hernias causing extrahepatic biliary obstruction as well. Um, so what are the pathophysiological consequences of biliary obstruction? Um, firstly, bile acids are critical for the absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins from the intestine. Um, so vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin, and if we don't have bile in the duodenum, we can see alterations in vitamin K levels leading to a hypocoagulability. Um, also, bile will bind to endotoxin and inhibit it. So if we don't have enough bile, there'll be an increase in circulating levels of endotoxins, which will also contribute to this hypercoagulability. Um, we can also see refractory hypotension. So experimental ligation of the bile duct in dogs lead, led to severe cardiovascular depression and hypotension that was refractory to um, treatment with noradrenaline. Um, we can also see diuresis due to the renal excretion of bile salts, uh, resulting in an acute kidney injury. Um, and finally, bile, the presence of bile salts in the abdomen, if you have a bile peritonitis, can lead to severe hyperosmolarity of the bile salts and an extracellular shift causing hypovolemia. Um, what clinical features can we see with biliary tract disease? So this talk is mainly going to focus on emergencies, so surgical emergencies. So the most important thing that we would see in that, in, in that sort of situation is what we call an acute abdomen. So dogs presenting with septic or non-septic bile peritonitis. Um, we also see animals presenting with a variety of very vague, non-specific signs like abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, pyrexia, or dehydration. You can see acolic feces, so that's when the feces lack bile pigment. Um, icterus, again, still fairly non-specific sign, um, and very rarely we can have animals presenting for primary coagulopathies. Um, Investigations, we can start off fairly general and basic. So hematology and biochemistry, really no specific changes that we would see, but very generally you can see an increase in bilirubin, um, maybe increases in liver enzymes and cholesterol. Doses can be seen um, and a decrease in serum albumin. Very rarely, again, you can see delays in your coagulation parameters. So PT and APTT, what you measure can be delayed. Um, but usually these take about 10 to 14 days to show any signs. So it's a very late presentation. And most of the cases we see have normal coagulation parameters to start with. Um, imaging is going to be your mainstay. Abdominal ultrasonography is by far the most common and most useful technique to image the biliary tree. So um, you can get really clear pictures of the liver, gallbladder, the biliary ductal system. You can sample peritoneal fluid. You can look at the echogenicity of the surrounding fat. Um, abdominal CT is used and maybe starting to be used more commonly, but still by far ultrasound will give you everything that you need to know. 
Um, to me, this slide is really, really important because um, from a surgeon's perspective, obviously the surgery is interesting and um, in most of these cases, that's not the challenging part, sadly. The, sa the really challenging part is stabilizing the patient because a lot of these cases are really, really sick when they present. They present quite late in the course of disease. Um, they're often severely dehydrated and hypovolemic. So fluid resuscitation is critical. Um, we need to look at estimating a fluid, a fluid deficit based on the hemo hemodynamic parameters that they um, present with. And initially, fluid resuscitation will start with color, uh, with crystalloids rather, sorry, so normal, normal fluids, um, and really should be targeted at improving those hemodynamic parameters. So very small boluses um, with constant monitoring. Um, patients that present with coagulation disorders or anemia might benefit from vitamin K supplementation. Um, again, if they're anemic or having bleeding disorders, plasma is useful for supplementation of um, uh, clotting factors specifically. Um, but in the absence of separated blood products, fresh whole blood is, um, is usually um, strongly indicated as well if they're anemic. Um, what about administration of antibiotics? Um, again, normal bile is sterile, but positive cultures are reported with biliary disease and antibiotics are usually administered, but we try to leave them for, for after sample collection. So you want your antibiotics to be broad spectrum. They should have a good coverage against both anaerobes and gram negatives and should be well excreted in bile. Uh, a second generation cephalosporin actually fulfills all these criteria. So um, something like cefuroxime is a perfectly suitable um, perioperative antibiotic to use pending samples. Um, so what, what really are the goals of surgery in patients with extrahepatic biliary obstruction or biliary disease? We want to determine the cause of obstruction and rupture. We want to reestablish bile flow for the reasons I mentioned. Bile is really, really important for normal um, physiology. So we want to reestablish bile flow. Um, and of course, we want to remove any necrotic or infected material. Um, so I'll come on to some specific disease examples now. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is a gallbladder mucosal. This is the most common cause of extra basically where the gallbladder becomes distended with an excessive production of mucinous material. Um, only two cases have ever been reported in cats, so it's very much a disease of dogs. Um, under, the incidence of underlying infection has been very variable, and the role that infection plays is actually controversial. We don't know whether it's a primary cause or actually secondarily caused by the stasis of bile. Um, and why do dogs get gallbladder mucosils? Again, we don't know. And some factors have been sort of, pre, um, sort of proposed. We know that certain breeds have a genetic predisposition. Um, it's been proven in Shetland sheepdogs. Um, border terriers are also at a very high risk of developing gallbladder mucosils. Um, cholestasis has been suggested as a, a potential mechanism for this disease. And finally, endocrinopathies. So dogs that have hypothyroidism or hyperadrenocorticism are at a much, much higher risk of developing gallbladder mucosils than, that, than those that don't. Um, so again, what, what can we see on our lab findings? Very, very nonspecific. Um, mild increases in liver enzymes. Elevation bilirubin might be present, especially if there's concurrent obstruction. Um, and a leukocytosis may be present in about half of the cases. Ultrasound will be your main mode of diagnosis. We see a classic, what we call a stellate appearance or a kiwi fruit appearance. It's um, pathonomic for a gallbladder mucosal. Ultrasound is also about 85% sensitive for detecting a gallbladder rupture. However, it's important to note that we can't really establish a correlation between ultrasound findings and clinical disease or rupture. So what that means is that cases that have the most severe ultrasound changes were not really the ones that were most likely to rupture. So we can't really use ultrasound as a sole method to determine treatment going ahead. Um, so this is an ultrasound image of a gallbladder mucosal, uh, that classic stellate appearance, as you can see, and sometimes it's it might be challenging to differentiate an early gallbladder mucosal from gallbladder sludge. And the way to do that really is that to remember gallbladder sludge is always gravity dependent and it will move with gravity, whereas a gallbladder mucosal is not gravity dependent and it doesn't move with patient positioning. Um, so what can happen in patients that have a gallbladder mucosal? We know about 30% of them will go on to develop extra hepatic biliary obstruction. About 23 to 60% of them will go on to rupture. Um, so therefore, really, the treatment is surgical and the treatment is a cholecystectomy or removal of the gallbladder because this removes the source of mucus production. 
we can't really open up the gallbladder and remove the mucin because about 80% of them have neural necrosis, so necrosis of the wall in the absence of evidence of rupture. The prognosis is about 20, um, a mortality rate of about 20 to 28% has been reported. So really quite high considering about one in five of these patients might die under um, with surgery. Um, the cause of death is very varied. So it can be things like pancreatitis or cholecystitis, repeat of extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Um, these patients are often vomiting. So aspiration pneumonia is a source of death. Um, again, as I said, these um, patients are quite unstable under anesthesia. So things like hypotension, um, they are hypercoagulable as well. So they can have coagulation disorders that can lead to thromboemboli forming. Um, sepsis or multi-organ failure are all um, reasons for death that has been reported. Um, so the next disease is cholecystitis or a gallbladder infarction. The etiology of this is septic. So it's often caused by bacterial infection of the gallbladder. So usually E. coli or Klebsiella, um, thought to be caused by bacterial reflux from the small intestine or from the enterohepatic circulation. Um, and stasis and a stasis of violent biliary distension might predispose to these infections. The most common sign that we see is vomiting, but um, patients can also present with more non-specific signs, like anorexia, abdominal pain, fever, or icterus. Um, the treatment of choice, again, is a cholecystectomy because you're removing the infected source. Um, often these cases have ruptured, so you are also looking at managing a case with septic peritonitis as well. So just these are some intraoperative pictures. Um, the picture on the left shows a ruptured gallbladder, um, and all you can see really is this sort of yellow necrotic wall of the gallbladder. And the picture on the right shows a gallbladder removal or a cholecystectomy being performed. Um, this green catheter you can see is a catheter that's been passed into the common bile duct. Um, and the uh, forceps are just holding the common bile duct there uh, just prior to ligation. Um, so coming on to cholelithiasis or gallbladder stones, in dogs and cats, the, the composition of these stones are mostly calcium carbonate or calcium bilirubinate, um, and possible causes, bile stasis, mucin overproduction, infection, or even idiopathic causes have been suggested. Uh, these um, patients can present with obstruction, so extrahepatic biliary obstruction. They could present with vomiting, icterus, or abdominal pain, and actually about a quarter of these are asymptomatic. Diagnosis can be on plain radiography, depending on the calcium content of the stones. But again, ultrasound is going to be more reliable and is going to reliably pick up gallstones because you can see these as hyperechoic structures with acoustic shadowing. Um, what treatment options do we have? So medical management has really not been proven to be successful. There is no real treatment for medical dissolution of these stones. Um, a cholidocotomy is where you would incise into the common bile duct to remove these stones. It's not a commonly performed procedure because there's a high risk of uh, dehiscence. Um, a cholecystotomy, where you incise into the gallbladder to remove the stones, again, not commonly performed, again, due to the risk of dehiscence. Um, the most common method of um, treatment is a cholecystectomy, where we remove the gallbladder because, firstly, it um, is a lower morbidity procedure, but also it removes the, um, the source of gallstones, and recurrence of these following cholecystectomy has not been report reported. Um, again, prognosis, overall, the mortality rate is about 10%, um, but the mortality is actually quite different whether these pa um, depending on if these patients present with an obstruction compared to if they don't. So if they present with obstruction, the mortality is about 25%, whereas if they're not obstructed, the mortality is about 3%. So again, it just highlights that this is a surgical disease. Um, and even if the patient is not obstructed, uh, surgery should be recommended given that if they then go on to obstruct, surgery is then a lot more complicated and a lot um, is of, carries a high risk. Um, so coming on to my first case example, uh, this is Riley. So Riley is a 12 year, six month male neutered Maine Coon. He presented with acute onset icterus, anorexia and lethargy. Um, on his clinical exam, he was found to be pyrexic and he had severely icteric mucous membranes. On his blood work, he had a marked hyperbilirubinemia and an increase in ALT and GGT. Um, so Riley underwent an abdominal ultrasound and as hopefully the images highlight, he had a marked dilation of his common bile duct with dilation of the intrahepatic ducts. We could also see accumulation of echogenic material within the common bile duct at the duodenal papilla. 
So these findings together with his clinical picture was suggestive of extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Um, and therefore we decided that Riley needed to go to surgery. Again, as we said, we needed to establish the cause of obstruction and reestablish the flow of bile. Um, so what, how do we perform exploratory surgery for, bile, uh, for biliary tract disease? Um, this slide just hopefully goes through performing an X-LAP. And while it is important, and these things, these points are important in biliary surgery, it's actually also quite important for general, um, just performing an X-LAP for various regions, reasons, including um, say something like an intestinal foreign body or a general explore. Um, the way we approach in our abdomen, which I'm sure everyone's aware of, is a ventral midline ciliotomy. It is really important that this ventral midline ciliotomy actually extends from the ziphi sternum all the way to the pubis. A large incision means that you improve your exposure, which is really important with um, liver and biliary surgery because the liver is really cranial and tucked up under the diaphragm. But actually it is important in all other sorts of um, exploratory abdominal surgery as well. Um, because ultimately the larger your incision, the wider that you are able to retract the abdominal wall without too much pressure, which means that it's less painful for the animal. And also just highlighting that incisions don't really heal um, end to end. So a incision isn't going to take longer to heal than a shorter incision because incisions will heal side to side. Um, in male dogs, when you're doing an X-LAP, it's important to remember to, when you're extending your incision cordially, um, that the, your skin incision is actually going to be parapropucial. And then once you get through the subcut, you go back into your midline to do your, um, to your, to do your abdominal incision. Um, removal of the falciform fat, again, absolutely essential for any liver or biliary surgery. I would say that it is recommended for any other form of exploratory lap laparotomy as well, because it generally improves your exposure. Um, but also excessive handling of the falciform fat has been linked to um, necrosis and uh, septic peritonitis. So removal of the falciform fat is very, very quick and simple to do. It can be done by just simply tearing the fat off the abdominal wall. You can use cautery if you have it, um, and then just ligate it cranially because there's just one blood vessel that supplies that um, and it really does improve your exposure. The use of abdominal retractors again crucial for most um, abdominal um, exploratory procedures but pretty much essential for any liver or biliary surgery. Um, these are the retractors that you can see in this picture and the spoon part of the retractor will um, retract your um, thoracic cage cranially so it helps with your exposure. Uh, liver and biliary surgery can be tricky for exposure even using these techniques. Um, there are some other things that we can do. The simplest one of which for me and something that I do for any liver surgery is just to pack a couple of um, large laparotomy swabs cranial to the liver, so between the liver and the diaphragm, to push the liver and the biliary system forward. There are other techniques described. Uh, you could consider inducing a pneumothorax by incising the diaphragm so that everything moves forward, um, but that does mean that you need need to have mechanical ventilation, ventilation, you have to ventilate your patient. Um, so coming back to Riley, this is an intra picture from Riley's surgery. He had a routine midline laparotomy. Um, as you can see on the picture on the left, his abdominal organs are really icteric. The fat is quite icteric as well. Um, and on the, the picture on the right just shows his liver, which was quite enlarged. And there were these sort of multiple green rounded lesions that ruptured on manipulation and released a material that was consistent with bile. Um, this picture shows his common bile duct. So the scalpel handle is lying adjacent to the common bile duct to show you how dilated it is. So in Riley's case, it was about two centimeters. Um, and normally the bile, common bile duct in cats is less than 0.5, millimeter, uh, 0.5 centimeters. Um, so it's markedly dilated in this case. Um, within the common bile duct, we could palpate a cholelith of about four to five millimeters and a second cholelith was also identified within the gallbladder. Um, so Riley had a little mini duodenotomy, so we incised into the duodenum over the common bile duct, um, and the, we attempted to uh, the common bile duct, and doing so meant that the cholelith was dislodged and bile began to flow again. We could flush the rest of the cholelith back into the gallbladder, and a cholecystectomy was performed. So the first picture shows the gallbladder being dissected away from the fossa within the liver, and the second picture shows a cystic duct being ligated. Um, so a little bit more about the surgical technique for a cholecystectomy. The most important step in this procedure is establishing the patency of the common bile duct. 
Um, because if you can imagine once you remove, um, even though you remove the gallbladder, bile is still produced in the liver and needs to exit into the duodenum. So that the route that, that follows is the common bile duct. So if your common bile duct is not patent, bile can't into the duodenum. Um, and actually, if you remove the gallbladder in that in under those circumstances, you are um, not leaving yourself with any mechanism to divert bile. And we'll talk about biliary diversion procedures a bit later. Um, so once you've established patency of the common bile duct, the way you do that was like I uh, discussed in the previous slide, you can incise into the duodenum and catheterize the uh, common duodeno, the duodeno papilla. Um, you can then release the gallbladder from the quadrate in the right medial liver lobes. Um, this is done using a combination of sharp and blunt um, dissection. Um, cotton tips, the cotton buds that you can autoclave are really, really useful in this instance. Um, there will be some bleeding, but it usually stops quite quickly. Uh, and then once you've dissected the gallbladder out, like I showed you in the previous picture, you can um, cross clamp and ligate your cystic duct and cystic artery. Um, this is from Riley's surgery, and these were the two quite large stones that we removed from his common bile duct and gallbladder. Uh, so what happened with Riley, his liver biopsy was consistent with neutrophilic cholangitis, and his bile culture was positive for an enterococcus species. Um, like I said, these cases are actually really sick when they come into us, so Riley needed quite intensive post-operative management. He was severely hypotensive and anemic and received a blood transfusion. So vigil feeding tube placed, um, and I would say that doing any sort of biliary surgery in dogs and cats, uh, placing a feed, feeding tube is essential. These cases are quite sick. They tend to be quite painful after surgery. They're very, very nauseous. Um, and enteral nutrition is extremely important. So I'd always consider placing a feeding tube. Um, right, antibiotics based on his color. And he was discharged from hospital without any complications. Um, so what do we know about the prognosis of following extrahepatic biliary surgery in cats? Um, this case series published by Mayhew et al. is actually the largest case series we have. It only looks at 22 cats. Um, and in these cats, the main reason for surgery was inflammatory disease. Uh, and in seven of these cats, the um, reason for surgery was a pancreatic or biliary adenocarcinoma. The majority of these cats underwent cholecystoenterostomy, which is a biliary diversion procedure that I will go on to discuss. And two of these cats had a cholecystectomy. Um, the mortality rate was really high, so all of the cats with neoplasia died within two weeks of surgery, and 40% of the cats with non-neoplastic disease went on to die within two weeks of surgery. So again, overall, very, very high mortality, um, but the mortality was much higher for cases that had neoplasia. Um, what do we know about extrahepatic biliary surgery in dogs? So this case series looks at 60 dogs. The most common reason for them to have surgery was necrotizing cholecystitis. Um, and the most common surgical procedure was performed was a cholecystectomy or, or gallbladder removal. Um, slightly better prognosis than in cats, so about 28% mortality within the first few weeks. Um, and they found, this paper found a few factors that were associated with early mortality. So the presence of septic bile peritonitis, an increase in creatinine, prolonged clotting times, and postoperative hypotension. So I'm just going to touch on this paper that was published fairly recently, so a paper from 2018 that looked at the outcome following elective cholecystectomy for the treatment of gallbladder disease in dogs. Um, so historically, there's been mortality rates of up to 40% described with cholecystectomies. Um, in this paper, they divided their cases into what they called elective versus non-elective. So elective cases were those that had really no clinical signs that could be attributed to gallbladder disease. So they had very, they had no clinical signs or very, very mild or non-specific clinical signs. On ultrasound, they, there were signs of gallbladder disease. So say a gallbladder mucosal, but there wasn't any signs of extra hepatic biliary obstruction, gallbladder distension or gallbladder rupture. The non-elective cases were cases that presented icteric, presented with signs of extrahepatic biliary obstruction, and on ultrasound had questionable patency of the biliary tract. Um, the most common indication for surgery in this paper was a gallbladder mucosal. Overall, the, this, case, um, this case series had a mortality of 9%, so less than reported historically. But the most interesting finding in this paper was that the mortality rate for the elective group was 2% versus 20% for the non-elective group. So the recommendation that came out of this paper was that surgical treatment should be recommended for all gallbladder mucosils, even in the absence of clinical signs. Um, and for me, this just highlights again that if you do see a gallbladder mucosil on ultrasound, that it should be attended to fairly quickly because you want to, you really want to get these cases before they start showing clinical signs as the prognosis can be very, very different. 
Um, so moving on to another case example. Um, this is Jake. Jake is a 10 year old male new to domestic short hair. He initially presented to the RVC before I started working there. So somewhere around 2017. And he presented with a history of chronic vomiting and weight loss. His initial physical exam was actually fairly unremarkable. Um, on his blood work, he had a mild increase in ALT. His abdominal ultrasound showed some signs of cholangiocystitis. Um, and interestingly, he also had a foreign body on, in his common bile duct, which was likely thought to be a grass seed. Um, at this stage, his clinical signs were thought to be attributed to inter, um, inflammatory uh, bowel disease and his biliary changes were thought to be unrelated. So he was discharged on a hydrolyzed diet, diet trial. Um, however, Jake came back two weeks later, and at this time, he was quiet and lethargic. He had an increased frequency of vomiting, and this time on his clinical exam, he was found to be markedly icteric, and he had marked cranial abdominal discomfort. Um, his blood work this time also showed a marked hyperbilirubinemia. Um, on his ultrasound, the previously identified foreign body was present. So given the signs that we were seeing on his ultrasound, and this time the changes in his clinical exam findings, we suspected that this foreign body would be causing some um, biliary obstruction, and Jake was taken to surgery. Um, so hopefully this video you should be able to see, uh, we've performed a duodenotomy, uh, and there's a grass seed that's been pulled out from the common bile duct, and you can see as it's been pulled out. Um, and the grass seed is in this little um, pot on the, in, in the picture on the right. So really quite a significantly large grass seed. Okay. Um, so Jake, at the time of surgery, had bile, bile samples taken, which were found to be positive for an entrococcus species, and he was treated with antibiotics. Um, however, during the period of 2017 to 2021, he had repeated episodes of what was presumed to be cholangiohepatitis. Um, on ultrasound, he was seen to have a very dilated duodenal capilla. His bile cultures were positive, and we thought that this dilated duodenal capilla was allowing for ascending, um, ascending infection, causing a, a positive bile cultures. He was also diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease based on his intestinal biopsies. However, he remained non-responsive to diet trials and antibiotics. Um, so I met Jake in May this year where he came in and he had an ultrasound again. He was, this time he was diagnosed with several stones in his common bile duct and intrahepatic ducts that were causing a partial or a complete obstruction. He also had associated gallbladder distension and intrahepatic bile duct uh, dilation, so all signs pointing towards an extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Um, so I took him to surgery again, and um, at this point you can see the picture on the left is showing a very, very dilated common bile duct and uh, intrahepatic ducts and a gallbladder as well. The picture on the right shows a duodenotomy that's been performed. The stay sutures that you can hopefully see are actually holding open the common bile duct. Um, the sutures are placed around the common duod the duodenal papilla. Um, we couldn't dislodge any of the stones from the common bile duct, so we performed a cholidocotomy, so incised into the common bile duct to remove these stones. Um, despite doing this, we still couldn't establish patency of the common bile duct because we thought the major duodenal papilla was actually stenosed. So at this stage, we decided that biliary diversion surgery was needed. So um, what can we do in these instances? So um, biliary diversion or um, cholecystoenterostomy is where uh, is a technique that is needed if you cannot establish patency of the common bile duct. It's basically where you're trying to provide an alternative flow of for bile um, other than the common bile duct. So you can either anastomose your gallbladder to the duodenum, a cholecystoduodenostomy, or to the jejunum, a cholecystojejunostomy. Um, it is preferable to anastomose the, the gallbladder to the duodenum because the presence of bile in the duodenum in dogs has been shown to inhibit gastric acid secretion. So if there's no bile in the, um, in the duodenum, you can have hyperacidity and ulceration. However, it's not always possible to do this because you can cause excessive kinking of the cystic duct while trying to um, anastomose it to the duodenum. The technique really involves creating two lines of suture, so two lines of um, anastomosis between the gallbladder and your intestinal loop. All of your anastomosis will end up with some sort of narrowing, but um, good mucosal acquisition will reduce the sen um, stenosis and having a nice long incision to start with. So the recommendation is at least two and a half centimeters to reduce your risk of stricture. Uh, so this is a schematic on the left that shows an anastomosis that's been performed. And the picture on the right is an intraoperative picture um, that shows the, a completed anastomosis. 
Um, and these are pictures from Jake surgery. The picture on the left shows the gallbladder. It's been isolated and sort of taken out of its fossa. And the picture on the right shows completed, uh, completed cholecysto um, jejunostomy. Um, again, so just another case series on the prognosis following cholecysto enterostomy in cats. Um, this case series also looked at 22 cats. The most common reason, again, was inflammatory disease and neoplasia in nine cats. Um, 14 of these cats survived to discharge. However, only six, so 27%, survived to six months. And all of the survivors were cats that had inflammatory disease. So none of the cats that had neoplasia made it to six months. Um, the median survival for cats with neoplasia was only 14 days compared to 255 days for cats with inflammatory disease. So again, really quite a poor prognosis, um, but maybe a better prognosis for cats that had inflammatory disease compared to cats that have neoplasia. Um, what do we know about dogs and their long-term survival after the similar surgery? So this case series looks at, looks at 15 dogs. 11 of these died within the study period, um, and six of these dogs died within the first 20 days. Um, however, unlike in cats, the underlying disease was not associated with the short or long-term outcome. Um, coming on to my next case example, this is Billy. Um, Billy was a 12-year, one-month male neutered border terrier, uh, and Billy had had a cholecystectomy due to a gallbladder mucosal 10 days previously. He then represented due to a two-day history of inappetence, vomiting, and a recurrence of his icterus. Um, on his exam, he just had really ictoric mucous membranes, and on his bloods, he had an elevated bilirubin. Uh, again, we went to a primary mode of diagnosis, an ultrasound scan, um, and this time he, we could see that he had a really distended common bile duct with dilation of the intrahepatic ducts and a hyperechoic surrounding peritoneum. So again, he had signs of extrahepatic biliary obstruction and we decided he needed to go to surgery so that we could hopefully relieve this obstruction and really um, reestablish the flow of bile. Um, so when we took Billy to surgery, the most stark surgical finding was that he had severe inflammation of the pancreas and the adjacent duodenal wall was very, very swollen and thickened. Um, the common bile duct was also grossly distended. The first picture shows a duodenotomy that's been performed and the little red catheter is catheterizing the common bile duct. The moment the catheter was passed through, a um, flow of bile was re-established, as you can see in the syringe uh, on the picture on the right. Um, so our working diagnosis here was that Billy had uh, extrahepatic biliary obstruction secondary to the inflammation caused by the pancreatitis. Um, so really, we hoped that the inflammation would reduce once the pancreatitis um, was brought under control. So he had what we would consider temporary extrahepatic biliary obstruction. And the way we would address these is to place a biliary stent. So the little picture on the top shows the red rubber catheter. So it's a simple urinary catheter that's been cut to um, a few centimeters. So the idea is that it just bypasses the entrance of the common bile duct. It doesn't go all the way into the gallbladder. And in Billy's case, he actually didn't have a gallbladder. So it was just um, passing through the common bile duct. Um, and it's sutured into the inside of the duodenal wall using a couple of PDS sutures. And this is left in place until hopefully the inflammation subsides and bile is able to be, uh, start flowing again. In most of these cases, the um, suture dissolves and the stent is passed in the feces. Um, and I don't think we've ever had to go back and actually remove them. Um, so this is just a slide to discuss the indications for cholidocal stenting. So as I said, in Billy's case, we used it for pancreatitis. So we can use it for reversible causes of extrahepatic biliary obstruction, pancreatitis being by far the most common, other inflammatory diseases like IBD, if they can cause, if they cause severe inflammation of the duodenal wall, may lead to extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Um, we can also use it, this is very rarely done anymore, but if you primarily repair the common bile duct, you can use a stent to hold it open and prevent stenosis. Um, and it can also be used in, as a palliative technique in cases that have non-resectable biliary tract neoplasia, for example. Um, if the owners need some time to consider their options, you can place a, um, a biliary stent across the common bile duct to uh, re-establish some flow of bile in the short term. Um, coming on to the last condition I'm going to talk about today, so bile peritonitis. Um, it's important to remember that normal canine bile is actually, stellar, uh, is actually sterile, but infection can develop through a variety of mechanisms like ascending GI contamination, intestinal translocation, or colonization from hepatic anaerobes. Um, in the case of penetrating injuries, you can have direct inoculation of, bile as, uh, of bacteria as well. The most common causes of um, bioperitonitis in dogs is trauma, necrotizing cholecystitis, or a ruptured gallbladder mucosal. 
Bioperitonitis is actually very rare in cats, um, but if it occurs, it's usually traumatic. And it's also important to keep in mind that upper GI tract injuries can also cause bioperitonitis. For example, a ruptured duodenal ulcer will result in leakage of bile from the common bile duct in that area and result in bioperitonitis. Um, so what do we know about the prognosis for bioperitonitis? Uh, again, this is the largest case series we have, 24 dogs and two cats. The main cause of effusion was disruption of the biliary tract secondary to trauma um, or second or necrotizing cholecystitis. Overall, the survival rate was 50%. Um, however, the survival for animals with septic biliary effusion was actually only 27%. Um, okay, so coming on to the last few case examples. Um, this was Benji. So Benji was a five-year male neutered Bengal. He presented with icterus one week following surgery for a femoral head and neck excision. He also had a history of receiving non steroidals while being anorexic in this period. So when he presented, he uh, was very weak. He had weak pulses, a low blood pressure, and a palpable abdominal effusion. Um, on his blood, so we could see an inflammatory leukogram. He also had a non-regenerative anemia and an elevated ALT and total bilirubin. Um, again, he was taken for an ultrasound straight away, and on his ultrasound, we could see a pneumon peritoneum, so he had free abdominal gas, and he also had free abdominal fluid. There was some evidence of duodenal ulcer ulceration on his ultrasound and biliary sludge in the gallbladder. Um, his abdominal effusion was sampled and was found to be a biliary exudate um, with intracellular cocci, so he had a septic bil biliary effusion. That's immediately caused for surgery, so he was taken, um, taken to an X lab. Um, on X-Lab, we found a large volume of yellow flocculent fluid that was suctioned from the abdomen. Um, these pictures are hopefully, um, are hopefully clear in that we can see the common bile duct and the duodenum, which is labeled. Um, and the little circle that I've just drawn around highlights what we could see about a four centimeter full thickness defect in the antimesendric side of the duodenum um, that was leaking in Jester. What you can't see in these pictures was as well, in addition to that ulceration and rupture of the duodenum, there was also another about a two centimeter full thickness defect on the mesentric side as well that was leaking in Jesta. Um, the picture on the right highlights a rupture of the common bile duct as well. So the, uh, the little hemostats are actually in the common bile duct. So he had a ruptured common bile duct. Um, interestingly, and I think incidentally in his case, um, he also had a tapeworm that was seen to be exiting the duodenal wound. Um, so just to summarize Benji's injuries and the sort of options that we might consider in his case, um, he had du uh, two ruptured duodenal ulcers. So we could consider debriding and repairing these ulcers primarily, but that would be very unlikely to be able to do um, because the ruptures were both on the mesentric and antimesentric side. So repair would probably lead to dehiscence and stenosis or maybe stenosis as well. Um, we should really consider resecting, but resecting the duodenum in this area would require biliary diversion as well. He also had a common bile duct rupture. So again, here we could consider repairing the common bile duct, but that's a high risk for dehiscence and stricture, or we could ligate the common bile duct and perform biliary diversion. So really, in, in Benji's case, given the combination of injuries that he had, we would be looking at performing a cholecystojejunostomy, so biliary diversion, and a gastrojejunostomy, so resecting the duodenum and anastomosing the stomach to the jejunum. Or considering the combination of injuries he had and really the poor prognosis, we could consider putting him to sleep as well. Um, so really, as I said earlier, the prognosis for biliary diversion in cats is very poor, so only a 27% survival at six months. Um, and given the extent of his injuries, this, in this case, his owners elected to um, put him to sleep, so which is something we did on the table in surgery. Um, coming on to my last case example. So this is Alfie. So Alfie was a two-year, five-month male neutered Labrador. He presented with a two-week history of vomiting, depression, lethargy, and progressive icterus. Um, on presentation, his mucous membranes were severely icteric, but he was otherwise stable. On his bloods, he had a marked hyperbilirubinemia and elevated ALT and ALP. Um, he had an abdominal ultrasound, which revealed a distended gallbladder with a very distended common bile duct. He also had a bulbous dilation in the duodenum just prior to the duodenal papilla. So his ultrasound findings were consistent with not only an extrahepatic biliary obstruction, but an intestinal obstruction as well. Um, so Alfie was taken to surgery, and interestingly, we found a large non-compressible foreign body within the duodenum at the level of the duodenal papilla. 
The duodenum was very stretched, but appeared viable. So we decided to perform a duodenotomy, um, which revealed a Kong toy. So Alfie had swallowed a Kong toy, which was obstructing his duodenum exactly at the level of the common bile duct, causing a combination of an intestinal and an extra hepatic biliary obstruction. So it just highlights that pathology of the duodenum can really affect the um, biliary tree as well. Um, so Alfie went on to do really well. These are some pictures his owner sent us just a week after surgery. So really he um, wasn't suffering any after effects from that. Um, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, these are my references. I'm happy to share them with anyone who would be interested. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Forum is open for questions. Um, I've just, I, I've seen there's a question from Senora, I think, about um, whether surgery is re recommended in all cases of cholelithiasis even when it's not causing an obstruction. Um, and I think, yes, the, the current thinking is that, yes, it is recommended, especially in dogs. We don't really know very much about cholelithiasis in cats, um, but in dogs, it is recommended just for the re reason that we, they do, there's a, quite a high incidence of obstruction. Um, and as I highlighted from the literature that we have, the mortality and the complications of surgery are much higher when these cases present obstructed. So um, incidental cases of cholelithiasis are still considered surgical. Could I ask a question that's not necessarily specific, but um, could you explain a little bit about seeing bacteria in the abdominal fluid that is intracellular versus extracellular and the, yeah. the implication of that? Yeah, so I think the implications of it are very significant. So for me, um, the primary method of diagnosing aseptic peritonitis is the presence of intracellular cocci. There's lots of literature about measuring fluid glucose, measuring fluid lactate and comparing it to blood lactate and, or serum lactate or serum glucose. But to me, those are really not very specific um, and there's a lot of variation. Um, but the presence of intracellular bacteria just absolutely confirms presence of septic peritonitis. And to me, that means it's 100% a surgical case and a surgical indication. So um, the first thing that I would do if I had a sample of abdominal fluid is to look at a, a cytology under a microscope, it's something you can do as a surgeon, something that I'm not very good with microscopes, but I'd still, you know, I can still do it encourage everyone to get used to doing that. So if you see intracell intracellular bacteria, so bacteria within the neutrophils, that is 100% diagnostic of um, septic peritonitis and is an indication for surgery. I don't know if that answers your question, Dr. Nanix. Uh, what if, if you have extracellular bacteria when technically it should be a sterile environment, right? Um, so extracellular bacteria can indicate contamination. So I guess, again, that's something to be interpreted in the light of your clinical picture and clinical findings. So if you have a post-surgical patient that has extracellular bacteria, then I probably wouldn't take that very seriously because that could indicate contamination. Whereas if you had a patient with extracellular bacteria when there's really no reason why they should have that, then that is maybe a bit more, uh, probably a bit more um, significant something to be interpreted in light of the clinical findings. But regardless of anything else, if you see intracellular cocci, that is 100% 100 sensitive and specific for uh, septic peritonitis. Dr. Okay. Mahika? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you explain again how you uh, anastomose uh, gold better into duodenum? Because that is very new to me. Sure, let me, um, let me try and find my slides so that yeah. might be easier. Um, Uh, yeah, this is probably easy. So um, what you, so the first step is similar to a, a gallbladder removal. So you have to release the gallbladder from its, from its fossa in the liver. Um, so you basically free it up until you have the gallbladder sort of standing on its little stalk. You can see here in this picture here, the gallbladder is basically been released. Um, we use a lot of stay sutures on the gallbladder so that you don't manipulate the gallbladder with instruments. You manipulate it with stay sutures. Um, and then you you just lie it alongside a loop of intestine, just see how it's going to lie and whether there's no kinking of the cystic duct. Um, once you're happy with your positioning, then you can make an incision. So the incision in the gallbladder wall and in the intestinal wall, so full thickness incisions, should be at least about two and a half centimeters. And then basically you just, in a simple continuous pattern, you do two rows of simple 
multiple continuous sutures on each side of your incision, incorporating the gallbladder wall and the intestinal wall. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mahika. Thank you. <clears throat> when you do that um, cholecystoenterostomy, Mahika, isn't there any ingesta flushing back? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why these cases have such a poor prognosis um, is because it's not it's not a physiologically normal situation. So you there's a high risk of ascending bacterial infection into the biliary tract. Um, so really, a, a, it's pretty much a salvage option. It's something that you do when you don't really have another option or another option left, and that really high like. A 27% mortality at six months is really a 27% 20, survival at six months is really poor prognosis. So that it's just, it, it is a salvage procedure ultimately. And also, you said uh, the aseptic peritonitis. Also, how would you um, diagnose that? And like, how would you decide when to open or like repair? Bile peritonitis, whether it's septic or aseptic, is still surgical. So if you have so when you sample your abdominal fluid, if you have the presence of bile crystals in your abdominal fluid, which is another thing that you would look for in cytology, um, and also just by looking at your fluid. So bile has a characteristic color. Um, so if it's not septic, it just means that you've got a rupture or a disruption to your biliary tract, which again is still surgical because you need to reestablish your bile flow. So if it's septic, that's a secondary infection, which just makes matters a bit harder, but it doesn't change how you manage the case. Now, why I'm asking this question is now we see a lot of FIP cases in cats. Yeah. So how would you differentiate that from bile peritonitis? So you shouldn't see um, bile, bile salts or bile crystals on uh, an FIP effusion. Um, this is not something I'm super familiar with, but FIP effusions have very characteristic um, like clinical pathological features. So I think you'd see macrophages on your um, cytology, you, you can do um, albumin globulin ratios on your fluid, but what you won't see bile crystals. And if you do see bile crystals, then that is secondary to bile rupture, which is not related to your FIP and it's a secondary problem. Okay, thank you. Um, I can see someone has their hand up. I'm not sure who it is. Um, there's one question in the chat box. Mahika, you can read. Shall I read it for you? Oh, no, I can see. Don't worry. Okay, so this is again Senator. Um, he says, I had a nine-year-old crossbreed dog with an acute abdomen, ultrasound showed a distended gallbladder with a stone at the bile duct opening, um, performed a cholecystotomy, removed the stone and the dog is fine. Uh, cholecystectomy is recommended in patients over a cholecystotomy. Um, so the short answer is yes, and I think a couple of reasons. So especially in dogs, it's been shown um, that gallstones can be recurrent um, and removing the gallbladder removes the source of gallstone production. So in the long term, a cholecystectomy is indicated for that reason. In the short term, we know that the opening and re-suturing the gallbladder has quite a high risk of dehiscence. So given when you put those things together, the recommended surgical procedure is a cholecystectomy. Does that hopefully answer your question? Any more questions? Yeah, Diana, I'm Erandika. I have a one just a question from. Uh, uh, hello. Yes, yes, yeah, we can hear. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Mike. I mean, I, in the in this uh, diagnostic level, Mike, actually, you mentioned about this, you know, blood picture. The gamma yeah. GT values and ALT, ASTN. Uh, you mentioned about this uh, uh, albumin values also, right? Yeah. So how it looks like whether it's going down or I mean, uh, what the what the pathoph pathophysiological region for that uh, going up or down in that case? Yeah. yeah. For so albumin, yeah. So albumin is 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 a very again a very very non-specific finding and it's not something I would really put very much weight on when you're diagnosing biliary disease. But really, the pathophysiology is liver dysfunction. So cholestasis is causing liver dysfunction and therefore a reduction in albumin um, in albumin albumin production. Mm -hmm. um, also secondary to a lot of these cases are very anorexic when they present. So just a uh, mm -hmm. reduced intake of albumin protein as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
are there any more questions or can we wind up? Um, great, well, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to have any questions by email. Um, if anyone's got any interesting cases, I'm happy to, happy to chat about them at any point. Thank you, Mahika. Uh, now, I invite, now I invite Dr. Sugat Premachandra, Secretary, Sri Lanka Vet Association to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dharani. Uh, Dr. Randika Kunaradana, the President of Sri Lanka Vet Association, uh, Dr. Mahika Saniuratna, our resource person today, dear doctors, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Sri Lanka Vet Association, I take this opportunity to extend our most sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. Mahika Saniuratna, who accepted our invitation as resource person despite her busy schedule. We believe that the knowledge you have shared will help immensely in the improvement of skills of veterinarian in Sri Lanka. Uh, and also I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Dayadi for your special support uh, to success this workshop as moderator. And also I would like to thank all the doctors and the students who participated today to make this workshop a success. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.